This is module 24. It's a continuation of our module. We should say corpora as secondary resource for EFT. In our earlier module, we have discussed how corpus can be used as primary resource for EFT. Here, we have also tried to discuss how that English language corpus can be treated as a secondary resource for developing language teaching materials and resources for the Indian learners. So here, our emphasis will be on use of ELC, English language corpora, as secondary resource for developing tools, resources, materials for the Indian language learners. The first one is ELT textbooks. So here, as a secondary resource, where we can use ELT corpora. So in our earlier module, I noted that uh, ELC can be used as a primary resource for various other activities, starting from pronunciation to stylistic researches. Here, when we are thinking ELC as a secondary resource, we are talking about uh, utilizing data, examples, and information from the ELC for preparing the ELT textbooks, designing or making syllabuses for ELT courses, writing new types of grammar books, reference text materials, developing term databases, good English dictionaries, idiom databases, phrase databases, proverb databases, and sample texts. So we can also visualize that as secondary resource, here in English language corpus has tremendous potentials to be useful for the Indian learners. Now, first, the ELT textbooks. We are not going to describe the, all those resources we have mentioned here in details. We will focus here how we can use them in ELT textbooks. The recent trend is that all ELT textbooks should be developed with examples and reference reports. As I have already noted that in earlier days when traditional ELT methods developed textbooks, they had their resources, their information, mostly intuitive or mostly from some Bible studies. The examples which are presented to the learners, the word list which are presented to the learners, the pronunciations which are presented to the learners, and the other uses, patterns, and any some information which is presented to the learners are mostly collected intuitively or in a small lexical matrix or text matrices. So, in our mind, these are not most reliable or authentic. Now, we are claiming that all the text materials, ELT text materials, need to be developed with data. So, when we look at the language, it is said that language looks different when we look at them at a lot at once. That means, when we have a large number of data with us, we can find out what are the important things, what are the important uh, resources, what are the important items, what are the important elements that should go in the teaching of the end. So, while we keep in mind what are the basic requirements of ELT learners, that is one side, so that we can prepare textbooks accordingly. In the reverse way, we also need to find out what is most recurrent, most frequent, most common, or most used in English corpus. So, those materials also need to be considered, to be included in. The ELT textbooks. So the argument is very simple. We want a kind of uh, textbooks which are made with uh, examples, with data, with information from corpus. Obviously, this has tremendous more advantages for the learners. First, it gives the learners a kind of uh, confidence that what we are learning is actually being used by other people. 
Second thing, if we learn those things, we will be more or less at par with the native, native people because we also learn the patterns of the news, the modes of using those things, and we are sufficiently enriched with the most recent data and uses based information that is required to detect, gather master the language. So one can be specific in choice of words, in choice of lexical style, in choice of grammar and all those things. An important thing we can also see is that suppose we are trying to teach those sentence construction types to the learners. So it is always always better that if our textbook contains those frequent sentence patterns which are observed in the use of the native English speakers. What are more frequent constructions in the English language corpus can be included into the textbooks. You can revise the textbooks. You can uh, update the textbooks with new set of information, new set of data that is given in the curriculum, English language curriculum, to upgrade, to supplement the existing knowledge base. So here, the argument is very simple: that take as much of data from the raw corpus or English language corpus, uses this data, and supplement, change, revise, or make new textbooks to the learners, for the learners, so that they are more updated, more equipped, and more uh, uh, empowered with a new set of resources to learn the language. Next, ELC-based or ELC-based dictionary for the we all agree that in cases of ELT, we need to have certain dictionaries in the form of word books at least, where the ELT learners can easily refer to those dictionaries, find out the words, the meanings, the pronunciation, the spelling, and all other relevant information to be used for the learning purpose. But normally what happens, the dictionaries which are given to the learners, we call it a learner dictionary, or table dictionary, or pocket dictionary, or school dictionary, or college dictionary, to the learners normally they actually refer to those dictionaries to empower themselves to learn our various usages. Now if you have a corpus based dictionary, that is far more powerful to the learners because in corpus based dictionaries, which are Discuss in the subsequent modules of what has been developed. We can note that here the preferences are given only the usage based examples. The examples of usage of the words are actually collected from the uh, corpus. So the learners know how those words are actually being used in the real sense in their daily life. Also, their basic senses, sense denotations, is also collected from the corpus. The most frequent sense which are captured in the corpus are naturally produced in the dictionary. So, not only the meaning, not the usage, and all other things, the corpus based dictionaries are highly useful for the learners for learning English. So, what happens, what are the basic advantages of this dictionary? Now, it includes the most frequently used English words collected from the ELC. So, usually control contains the most frequently used words, say 5,000 most frequently used words. So, the learners have the kind of confidence that if you can learn those 5,000 words, perhaps they are far better equipped to deal with the language, to use the language in different ways and to interact, to communicate in a far better way. Second, words collected from ELC will be stored in an alphabetical order, so they can clear the idea, also with frequency information, so they can find out which words are more frequent and which are entitled to be thrown in the dictionary. Each word will include at least 10 examples of this experiences collected from the corpus. So primary three things are addressed. Most frequently used words, words are arranged in alphabetical words, 
and the basic primary senses, primary ten senses at least, are produced in sticks to the lungs so that they know how to do it. How to use them, how to assemble them, and how to make them more equipped with new set of data, new language, new information, uh, which is recurrent, frequent, common, and used in vogue among the uh, I mean, English language speakers. Here I am giving you an example to show how the sense of existence of the world yeah, has need to be learned by the lungs. These are examples taken from the uh, British National Geographic to show that how the particular word can have two di five different meanings or different senses. And ELT learner must learn all those things to have certain amount of mastery in the sense variations of words in English. The word is here deliver. The lady has delivered a child, girl child at the hospital. The teacher has delivered a fine lecture in the class. The courier boy has delivered the packet in the afternoon. The leader has delivered a long talk at the rally. And the bowler delivered a cookie as a left hander in the first round. If you look these five examples, which are taken from the English language corpus, clearly show that the word deliver has been used in five different senses. So as a learner, English language learner, we need to have all the senses presented in the dictionary. So dictionary will have all the words as well as their sense variations usages. So what happens? <clears throat> a conceptual frame to formulate, if you refer to the figure two here, you can find out that in cases there are several rules embedding into those usages. The rule one is if that word belongs to the domains of medical science, it usually refers to the sense of giving birth of a child. But in cases of rule two, if it is a discourse is classroom discourse, it refers to teach something to the learners. Rule three is, if it is a mass rally or public rally or political rally, then it refers to speak to a public in the gallery. Rule four says, if it is a courier service, then it to carry or to give something is the basic sense of the word deliver. In fact. If the domain is cricket, a kind of play, a game, then it is to throw a ball to the batsman in a different way. So what we find here is that the term has a broad conceptual net or frame where we can find out it has five different broad senses based on the discourse structure or discourse domain and everywhere it has a different meaning. So all those information we captured in the list and presented to the learners. So the learners are better trained, better equipped with the use of various sets and dictionary and many examples. So, so many synonymous words can come in the corpus and it becomes uh, important for us to capture those sense variations, to capture the meaning variations, uses variations. So uh, to to empower the learners how they can excel in use of English. So the basic argument is that English language corpus can be a very good source for developing uses based on dictionary that has ready help or can be quickly, easily usable by the English language learners. And it has several pedagogy. Yeah. But after that, there is also, if we are talking about a uh, dictionary of uh, words which are most frequently used and usage based typically for the ELT students. But we always know that it is not only the words and the meanings and the usages that actually determine the efficiency or skill, skill or uh, uh, mastery of the language. It is always noted that you get mastery over the language when you are very well equipped to use uh, set expressions like 
idioms, phrasal verbs, proverbs, as well as very elegant in use of uh, those rare uh, group verbs, uh, appropriate prepositions, even slang. So what we said to say that uh, using uh, those set expressions, frozen forms, and uh, phrasal verbs are more important to have good clarity, good mastery of the language. But what happens in cases of lengthy courses? We hardly pay much attention to them. So here we are view that if we can develop a good dictionary of set expressions, phrases, idiomatic expressions, proverbial expressions, even slangs also, then they can be very useful for yet learners, particularly those advanced learners can use those materials. Here I can give you a list where I have shown that uh, how these English, most frequently used English terms, are idiomatic expressions and proverbial expressions can have translational equivalents from various Indian languages and that can be part of the vocabulary or part of the training module. Here I'll give you the list but before that what you can do is that have a bilingual dictionary of something like that uh, a dictionary of set expressions then we can have a kind of uh, ready resource available to the learners. What we can do here is that we can retrieve the most frequently used in this idiom spaces and trouble from ELC, decipher their actual sentences expressed in different contexts of their usages. Then we can classify those senses in appropriate scheme, scheme of sense classification. Then we can find out the appropriate translation equivalence of those expressions, set expressions from different native languages, say Bangla, Hindi, Oriya, Tamil, Madhu, Malayalam, or Konkoni, or Marathi, or Gujarati, or some other languages. Then we can supply these appropriate matches generating a dictionary of idioms, bilingual dictionaries. So what have to happen? This would be a very ready resource to the learners. They can use directly or all the time refer to that. I'm going to give you an example from how I have developed one uh, dictionary of English idioms and proverbs and the translational equivalents are provided from Bangla and put together side by side. It is a bilingual, bidirectional uh, idiomatic dictionary databases for machine learning system and machine learning as well as for ELT purposes. Here are some examples. Suppose here in English example we have got apples of one eye, apple of one's eye. So here we have a Bangla proverbial expressions also, a Bangla set phrase is called Choker Moni. So setting crocodiles here can be as an equivalent here Bangla, Kumbhira Su Barjan Kora. To make a bedlam is Narak Guljar Kora. So blue blood is Nil Rakta, bold from the blue Bina Mega Bajrapa. So this is a long example list which shows that it is very much possible to collect the set expressions, idioms, proverbs and other properties, something like that, from English language corpus, process them and generate translation and equivalence from the target languages and to produce that dictionary both in digital note form, most preferably digital form, also printed form is also available if possible to the learners so that learners can directly refer to those things and can empower themselves with more power or more stock of vocabulary and stock of set expressions so that they can have good mastery of the language. Finally, we are talking about the ELT grammars. So as you know that when we are teaching grammars, we want to teach many things to the learners regarding the types of sentences, uh, regarding the formation of sentences, the phrase structures of sentences, uh, classification of sentences based on form, based on meaning, based on content, and many other things. How sentences to be formed, how clauses are embedded, how clauses are made, how phrases are assumed, ordered, and all those things, as well as the constitutional structures of the sentence, a lot of things. So, what ha it happens that all the time we give some intuitive examples to the learners and 
give a set of rules uh, to the learners to learn it, to memorize it, to do assembly with it, and to produce similar kind of constructions. Here our algorithm is that whenever we are trying to develop a new grammar, the let this grammar be corpus based because corpus provides new set of examples, new data, more authentic data, more reliable data, and we can have a new set of grammar. Here, this grammar book can be systematically in a uh, in an ordered manner can be developed so that grammar for the primary learners, grammar for the beginners, grammar for the uh, moderately advanced learners, grammar for the advanced learners. So there are many different ways to produce the grammars. For default, what we propose is that uh, in the grammar also there is one important part is called morphology. So how the words are formed? This is there are some rules, some patterns. So what happens in traditional way? We put some rules and say this is the stem and this is the affix. They combine together. They generate word. Sometimes they produce it. But if we take examples from the corpus, analyze them, decompose them, and show them how they actually combine to form the words to generate the words then that becomes much more useful. Look at the English word form. So you know that this particular word can be affixed in many ways to generate uh, more than 200 different forms. So it is not possible for a teacher to assemble to produce all these things from his mind and produced to the learners. And to show that from the different word formation mechanisms or strategies or rules are applied here. But it is very much possible that to collect all the forms of the word form from the corpus, classify them systematically, arrange them, and show how those are formed by combinations of different word formative elements. So what we say is that teaching grammars to ELT learners is very much useful or very much helpful, beneficial if it is based on corpus. So here what we have said or uh, we have tried to argue or establish is that that English language corpus is a good resource like English language teaching purposes. It has two broad applications. One is it can be used as a primary resource in classroom teaching where learners directly can access those resources, materials, or text pages or corpus, the data itself, to address various questions and queries and problems of language teaching. Thus, they can benefit a lot direct with reference to the corpus. On the other hand, this ELC corpus can be utilized as a store of huge data, resource of various varied data of texts of different types to be used for developing English teaching materials, textbooks, grammar books, study materials, course materials, even redesign the teaching syllabus, dictionaries, monolingual dictionaries, bilingual dictionaries, uh, as well as the bilingual uh, dictionaries of set phrases, idioms, proverbs, and others. In both cases, these are far more advanced, far more usable, and user friendly, and more authentic and helpful for language teaching. So, our suggestion is here is that if we want to enrich the English skill of English or ability in the English of the learners, then we definitely need to refer to the English speech and text corpora, which are now easily available both in raw and processed manner for ready usage and applications in English language teaching. Thank you.